Hello, everybody. How you guys doing? I'm back. Got home last night. How about the new shirt? It's even got the price tag on it. This shirt I bought for the wedding for Carmine's daughter, Bianca. I don't know. I went in. Didn't have much time. That'll do. That'll match the black. And uh, I hated it, so I didn't. I didn't wear it. Just wore a black T-shirt. Right? That's rock and roll metal. Anyway, so I thought I'd wear it today. I tell you what, it sucks playing in a long sleeve shirt. Holy shit. I never played in a long sleeve shirt, really. Um, there's like no ventilation on the arm. And, uh, oops. And you see uh, these old videos of Buddy Rich and Louis Belson, all the old jazz guys, and Buddy Rich is playing like a monster, and he's playing in a sweater. It's like, how do you do that? You know, and I even got a fan over here, my trusty fan. I got to have air blowing uh, when I play. It makes me play better, believe it or not. I feel air going. It, it, it makes me uh, speed up a little bit. <laughs> shirts happening. I feel like I'm like in the uh, Osmonds or something. So, uh, yeah, I forgot I left the uh, price tag on. 50 bucks for this shirt? It's terrible. 50 bucks. I got it for 34. <laughs> and I didn't know how it's been so long since I bought a shirt with a neck size. So the lady at the store is going, oh, your neck size is uh, 17 to 17 and a half. Go, really? Because, you know, stuff, the T-shirts, there's no neck size. Pretty funny. So I thought I'd wear it and get a kick out of it for Halloween. There's the Halloween pumpkin in the front. See that? That's Lala. Lala's pumpkin. She likes to buy pumpkins during Halloween. Me, I don't give a crap, you know. So, because we're never here, you know. We just got back last night. We played with Last in Line. Four really great shows, uh, starting in Buffalo and working our way all over the place. Actually, Buffalo, and then where'd we go? Pennsylvania, then back up to Poughkeepsie, and then ended it in New Bedford. Yeah, New Bedford, uh, you know, these tours are like here, you go here, then you got to go back down here, then you go back up. Some of the tours I've been on is, wow, it's crazy, you know, but that's the way it is. And uh, we had a great turnout. Thank you, all the fans that showed up. And uh, the places were pretty full, so it was really cool. And we were supposed to play, oh, my head's cut off a little bit. Sorry about that. I can sit down like that, play like this. That won't work. We had a great turnout. We uh, thank everybody for coming down. And we were supposed to play with Winger in uh, Pennsylvania, but Winger had to postpone their show because of uh, somebody got a little ill with you-know-what. So I wish them the best, and they're going to postpone them for a couple of weeks and then 
check them out. It would have been a great show. Last in line and winger, you know. So uh, we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll do some more shows together. And then uh, what else? Then we leave tomorrow night. No, not tomorrow. The next day, <laughs> fly all the way back to the East Coast. And we play in New uh, where, where were we playing? Laconia, New Hampshire, and then Hopewell, Virginia. And that Hope, Hopewell gig's great gig at the theater there. And we were supposed to play there, I think, four or five times. We played there twice, and then the gig was booked, and the, the pandemic thing happened, and it was booked two other times, and it was like we seemed like we never got the, would get there. Same thing with the last gig in New Bedford. You get postponing it, postponing it. So... We'll be there. Halloween will be uh, Hopewell, Virginia. So that should be a good show. I like Halloween. You know, anything could happen, you know? So, uh, okay. so uh, we'll be on tour for those dates, and then we come back to California in November. We do some shows in November here, one at, one at the Whiskey, one in Ramona, California, one in Vegas. Vegas, Vegas. And last night, you know, it's, it's always sunny and California, right? You heard that kind of something like that. Well, last night we flew in from, we had to go from, where did we go? Boston to Charlotte, which I don't know why we went to Charlotte, but that's the connecting flight. Though that flight was kind of a waste of time <laughs> further away than just going from Boston to LA to San Diego, actually, not LA. And, uh, so we did that, but the planes were late, of course. Lately, they've all been delayed. And then we finally got on the plane, landed in San Diego about an hour late. But I was told that when we landed, the airport closed because it was storming in San Diego, beautiful San Diego, where you come out of the airport and you see palm trees and the, and the water and the boats and so nice, lights, colored lights and stuff, and storming. So the planes couldn't land. They had to land in Vegas or LAX because they were running out of fuel. That's good to know that they don't have that much fuel when you're flying on these things. And uh, luckily, we were late enough where the weather cleared up. You know, that beat reminds me of... Uh, you know, o the opening of the hi-hat, right? A lot of rock guys don't play open hi-hat, you know, like. <laughs> so the trick with some of the open hi-hat stuff is how long, or the question is, how long do you keep the hi-hat open? You know, you don't just go, you know. That doesn't sound good. It's got to be in, in time with the tempo of the beat, you know? So those are kind of eight notes. One and. One and. See? That's opening and closing on kind of on the end. So it's very important to figure out uh, you know what that is. That it's very important to figure out how long to keep that open. So it's in time. It's got a sound, you know, you could add that sound to, you, to your songs and stuff. You're playing a heavy song, um, slower, like... So basically, that's what I'm playing on the hi-hat. If I played it on a tom, so... Like this. So experiment with that. And then there's also the uh, the old standard, you know. 
I, I tell a lot of guys, uh, teaching wise, good exercise for this is just playing the open hi hat like this. Basically, this is what happens with your feet. See? And when I put the right hand in to open the hi hat, I'm still doing this. So that's a good exercise. You get it faster, too. One of the things I like that John Bonham did is he did, instead of one bass drum, like this, he did two. Like two sixteenth notes. Without the hi-hat, like that. Then you open the hi-hat. Now that's hard to close it with the double bass drum. You got to figure out what sounds best. But that's in the beat he played, the world famous beat, like this. Like this. See? So that's the trick. Here it is, slow down. Practice. And what John did is it kind of incorporated it into the triplet feel. And the way to do that, see, I got the two left hands on the snare drum, see, this is another way to approach that beat, see, so you got first note, two here, and then the two on the bass drum, one on the hi-hat. open high hat try to talk at the same time then you can That's what you want to get. So many different ways you could play the hi hat. That uh, that beat, kind of holding it open. Ooh. I don't hold it so long. Sounds kind of funny. Sounds like you're cutting it off. You are cutting it off. I am cutting it off. That's the open hi-hat thing. And the song I played um, is uh, a song by Kill Devil Hill. And that's uh, called uh, Endless Static.
But an approach to this, let me find the beginning. Not bad. Right? So it's a fast song. So that's the tempo of the song. I was doing a whole bunch of different types of fills in there. All this stuff you hear on uh, it goes way back even to Dio days with these crazy accents and that other uh, the one going into the verse with the vocal. Whatever it is. I'm listening. Whoa, what's that? Those are me. I'm always taking the song. Why don't we do, uh, you know, some sort of accent? <laughs> And we learn it, and, and then when I go back and listen to these songs, I, holy shit, I didn't realize we did that. Now I gotta learn them. That one was an odd one. So. so, anytime you hear that, and up to Dio, up to, uh, not Sabbath so much. Sabbath was a little bit, because Sabbath was Sabbath. And uh, last in line, all these crazy accents in there are my ideas, because I'm crazy with accents. The one that always gets me, I think I mentioned this before, is in Last in Line, the song Last in Line. In the very beginning, it's soft, and there's a hang, there's four. Vocal, right? Then the next one is one, two, Three, four, five. <laughs> it's a whole of, it's like six, but that was my idea. And, and to this day, it always puts me on edge when we come to that part. Make sure. That's why there's that fill. So everybody comes in. Anyway, my point with this, this thing here, uh, this beat that was in the song. What I do, you can play so many different roles. Those are eighth notes, eh? That's one way to play a fill in this song. It's the same eighth notes, right? Another way, 16. The 16th more interesting by doing like something like this. So you got eighth notes, 16th, and you can put triplet, nice triplet fill in there. And these, uh, you know, these uh, makes the song a little bit more melodic. So. so all those different um, ways to play fills in these in these fast songs, and that's what I use. Uh, the eighth notes too, you can go. Kind of a signature thing. Oops. So I like to lead with my right. So you got to make sure you go. I'm on the wrong sticking. It's got to start. Yeah, I don't know what it is. 
So there's all these different fills you can do. Eighth notes. You can even do quarter notes or quarter note triplets like this. Those are triplets. When you do them that slow, when you play fills like that, you better make sure you're in time, you know. You can easily throw the band off if you miss it. You know? This is nothing keeping the tempo, really, inside of those, that fill, you know. So you got that, and you got eight notes. Triplets. Yeah, so that's just a little uh, explanation of how I approach some of these songs, you know. And this way, not every fill is, is fast. The next one. I'll break them up with this other stuff. Okay, so we have La La Lollipop. Hi, La La. Hello. La has been getting quite a lot of recognition on the road. If those of you that don't know, she does the merch for Last in Line with us. She's my girlfriend. Beautiful girlfriend. Bella, bella, bella. Uh, thank you. Do you like the shirt? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I don't. It's hard to play in this thing. Don't get used to it, folks. No way. Unless I'm playing, I don't know. A wedding? How would those fills work in a wedding? Yeah! I should get the pants to match. Powder blue? I think they make those, too. So anyway, um, Lala's been getting quite a lot of recognition from people on the road, and that's really cool to see. Um, one day she'll be doing the show, and I'll ask the questions. <laughs> we'll do that one week. Yeah, right. She'll demonstrate some. She can play a little bit. I taught her paradiddles and double paradiddles. That's it. She doesn't practice. No. No. Okay, let's take some questions from you guys. A few questions here. Do you ever get blisters from playing so hard without gloves? Uh, do I ever get blisters? Yeah. No, you know what? This is like these hands. This is hard. It's callous, right? They're where it should be. You know, holding the stick. It's like a straight line down your palm, and it's callous. So it's like leather, you know. And sometimes what happens is when you're playing a lot of shows, that gets so bloody hard. You got to go like bathe it. Sometimes, like you go back to the hotel and it's hot water. Soften it up and then put lotion on. You got to take care of your hands, you know. So otherwise, it gets so hard, then it's, it might crack, and then you're like, ah, that hurts too. Blisters don't. Blisters are when you um, haven't played in a long time, and then you start playing, you get a blister because there's nothing there to protect your hand or your skin, and you get a blister. And the only other time that happens when you have been playing is if you're in a hot, humid place. We, a couple of weeks ago, we played somewhere, and it was hot and humid, and I'm playing, and I could feel it's starting to get like a blister-type burn, you know, and that's from the humidity, and I remember one time we played in Australia with Black Sabbath. It must have been 110 degrees in this building. <laughs> it was packed with people. It was a big shed, and it was hot as hell in there, and my hands start sweating, you know, that's bad you know you start you know you sweat and then your hands start sweating that's hot so the sticks rubbing on the moisture and pff, trouble you know but i don't wear gloves so i don't like gloves but i do oops i do tape certain my two thumbs and i tape this finger because these are prone to crack like when you're playing just from the hit and the vibration you get like a paper cut on the top and it just burns and kills you okay 
Hey, uh, Rita Lee is still in Colorado. We were wondering if Rita Lee, who's watching, is coming to the whiskey. I don't know if they're back. She might might answer. Okay, so let's take another question from you guys. On the big tours, how many drum sets do you bring with you? On the big tours, wow, just one drum set. But you bring parts, you know. You bring lots of heads. I used to have just a big giant case, just the heads. Uh, another case of sp- <clears throat> spare parts. Anything can break. Like the other night, I broke a mallet. One of these mallets. I've never broken one of those before. It just broke right off at the bottom. And uh, we have plenty of those and foot pedals. And you bring... You got to bring a, a spare or two snare drum if you're doing big tours and hi hats. Things, couples, you're almost duplicating the hardware. You know, drums don't usually break, but you do need to bring some lugs. Sometimes the lugs break, you know, and obviously the cymbals break too. And uh, on these dr- these drums are the Command Series drums uh, from Sawtooth. There, no, that's Chromacast. That's the mother company, Sawtooth. And these are these are poplar wood, and this is not a very very expensive kit, but it sounds great. I had a lot of comments on the last four dates we did, uh, and uh, about how this bass drum just kills it. Because the one live, I have two heads on it, no hole in the middle, and it just kills. And and then uh, that's what I'm playing here. These are 12, 13, 18, 24 by 14, and this is the Hickory snare they just came out with. Beautiful snare drum. This is more expensive. Um, it's a more expensive drum. They have the set, but it's probably in the ocean uh, in these, you know, in Long Beach Port here, because we're all in California, me and the company. And there's a hundred and God knows what ships that can't unload, and there's tons of cargo sitting on the pier, and nobody knows what to do. So when they get it, it's going to be available. And uh, it's a great Hickory kit. But the Command Series sounds fantastic. This I've been recording with them and using them for years. So if you're looking for a good value uh, kit, check it out. And also on sale is on the uh, the seat. And the seat uh, is a Chromacast seat. It's a great seat. It goes low. I play low. I play kind of low. And this seat goes pretty low for me. It's great. you know. And the seat's important. And it's kind of a bicycle shape. And it supports you. It sp- supports your back without a good seat. If you have a bad seat, you could probably play like this. See? That's what happens. Your back's going to hurt. You go, oh, man. And then you get a good seat. That's what a good seat does. So check out the seat. I think it's on sale for $109 or $119. Either $119, $109. And uh, it's a great seat. It's very, very solid. Uh, if I go to a drum clinic somewhere or over the years I have, and they go, well, here's your kit. I go, cool. And then they got one of these seats for like a 16-year-old. It's about this big. I said, I can't play on that. You know, and the seat goes like this. This doesn't do that, obviously. There's a very good seat and uh, it's a great price too so check it out that's what's on sale on the app this week because they like to you know rotate all their great products around and that's what's on uh, on sale so check it out seats are very important just almost more important than some of the other stuff you know when i go do uh, like a rock camp i go into hollywood i bring the seat because i don't like their seats and plus if i'm sitting too high that's not i don't like that either the seat goes nice and low Okay, next question. Mark Weber wants to know where your emergency sandwich is. Mark Weber? Yes. Sir. Mark Weber is the one man crew we use in last in line. Hey hey Lala, give yeah. me that case that's right over there. I'll show Mark Weber where the emergency sandwich is. Because there's rules of the road. The rules of the road for me are you eat when you can. That means there's not always food around, especially on the tours we're doing. You eat when you can, you shower when you can, you when you can, and you poop. <laughs> and then you're cool, right? So, but I always bring, like, I'll go in and get a sandwich. We stop somewhere. Even though I'm not hungry, it's 11 in the morning, 
But I know, you know what? We're going to get to the gig. We got There's going to be nothing to eat. We got to do sound check, VIPs, all this stuff. And then it's 6 o'clock and I'm starving. So I always bring an emergency sandwich. And I usually put it in this Chromacast case. It's a Snares case. And uh, I showed this before. It has a great secret stash here. Here's the snare drum. goes in here. And then this opens up, boo, for the sandwich. So that's where the sandwich goes, Mr. Mark Weather. Here we go. Oh, shit. Let's turn the light around. That's okay. It needed this. That light. So anyway, let's continue. Mark, we'll see you soon. Again. Again. Describe the shells and their composition. Well, the shells on these drums are, um, I think the six-ply poplar wood. Poplar wood used to make sticks out of poplar wood, so it's an unusual wood. But it has a lot of sustain and warmth. I know it's hard to hear probably over the mics. It goes through this thing. It goes through that thing. Then it, impl then it goes to the computer. Then it goes to Facebook and who compresses it. And then it comes out. But I think the drums sound pretty good. So uh, that's the compos composite. I don't know. It's just poplar wood, you know. And uh, they sound great. The, the snare drum's hickory wood. Six-ply hickory wood. And there's no filler in these drums. A six-ply of uh, poplar or six-ply. There's no, like, plywood or... or uh, you know, any any kind of funny stuff in there. Same with the uh, snare drum. That's why they sound is such a crack. Hold your ears, la la. Sound, it's a great sounding kit, so that's what that is. I know who I look like. I look like the guy from my 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 pillow. <laughs> I need a cross, right? Ah, it's my my drums. You get them now, two for forty nine dollars. He's he wears a shirt like this. He wears a blue shirt. Blue shirt. Okay, next question. Have you ever broke a symbol? Oh yeah. Have I ever broke a symbol? Shit yeah. I used to break them when I was a kid, you know. Uh, I've used a number of different brands, and I've broken cymbals. And then when you're a kid, you know, when it starts cracking, oh, let's drill a hole where the crack's going. That's supposed to stop the crack from cracking more. So I drill a hole there, and then it would crack another direction. So it's like, that didn't work very good. It worked a little bit. So, yeah, and uh, what I use when I went to Sabian, these are Sabian double A's. These are medium crashes 18 20 20 ride 14 hats and these are thick symbols i've been beating the hell out of these symbols over a year and a half on this show and whatever i'm doing here and live with the band i think the symbols i'm using are over two and a half years old and we you know we play loud and i slam these symbols and they still sound great and i can hear them over the band they haven't lost any of the any of the uh, tack or volume, anything. So, it's great cymbals. And I play with the butt end, you know. I'm, you know, that's a lot, that's a lot more wood uh, on, on the cymbal than the tip, right? You know what the tip's for, everybody knows that. It's for girls. Okay, next question. No, I'm kidding. Okay. What, if any, plugins are you using on this live snare and pick on the live sound? I don't use plugins. Shit. I'm plugged in. It's called Learn. Here's the plugin. Hang on. This is the plugin. A drum key. That's how you plug it in. Tune the drums. Like in the 80s, everybody used these plugins. I'm like, it sounds like everybody sounds like kind of similar. Perfect sounding snare drum, you know, there's no dirt in it. And I like the dirt, you know, this bass drum looks kind of growling. This vibration is a bit rattles and the snare. I keep the snares loose. Okay. Is 
the meter over here is in the red. Yes, all you engineers out there. It's in the red. Little bit of dirt. My saying, my saying I came up with a couple of weeks ago is everybody could use a little distortion in their life. Here we go. Not only guitar players, you know, you distort it a little tiny bit. And it's and it's more growly, more like pissed off, you know. Unless you're playing, you know, music that the shirt would go with. But I don't play that. So are there any plugins in the slide pack? Oh, sorry. Any plugins? No. No, I tune them. I tune lug to lug. Yeah, I, I tune them before, but they move a tiny bit. So I learned how to tune the drums, you know. I know what I want to sound like. Nice spread between the kick and snare. And then the, the toms, you know, you know, that's what it sound like. Something from high to low. It doesn't have to be this range. And then you get down here. This is the big guy. And here's the big guy. Big, bigger. See? Hey, Mark, if you're still watching, I want to change those heads for the next couple of gigs. You know what I mean? Okay, so uh, no plugins. Vinny's no plugins. Uh, when we mix stuff, there's really, you know, it's up to the producer. That sometimes they might put a little tiny thing in the mix, but don't tell me about it. I could hear that stuff anyway. I could take that out. Okay, next. What's your opinion on direct drive pedals? Uh, direct drive pedals. I never, t I never uh, tried those. I don't know. This pedal's a uh, chain-driven chroma cast. It's fast. I don't know. I never tried one. I'd like to try one. I'll check it out. But uh, this this pedal's a just a, a big old fat chain, and uh, it's a very fast pedal. Tricks to getting a fast foot too are, uh, you know, the way you tune your head too. If the, the head's really, really, really loose. You're going to get no re rebound. So you kind of want to play around with the tuning of the drum and the foot pedal and the spring and the foot height, the mallet height, all that stuff makes a difference. You know, so uh, same thing with the drums, you know, with the tuning. Mess around with the stuff when you get it. When you get a new set, tune it. Try different tuning. Try to pedal all different adjustments until you get comfortable and you go, whoa, this, this adjustment here is faster. <laughs> Tonight we're going for Mexican food. Yum. Yum. Because we've been eating a lot of sandwiches on the road. It's yeah, like too many sandwiches. turkey and what's that eat? I don't anything. <laughs> the other night uh, we we were going on in Poughkeepsie. There's nothing to eat, and I'm like, I'm oh, really hungry. And I'm not supposed to really eat sugar. Um, so there was Mark Weber's double stuffed Oreo bag in the dressing room. <laughs> I went, this is terrible. I'm going to shock my system. Heidi, I don't know if you're watching. So I undid the Oreos, and I just ate the black part of the cookie. You know, for, so when I go on, I got some food, and I could burn it off. I did three of those. And then the other halves, I kept piling them up till they were like triple triple stuffed Oreos on the, on, on the dirty, filthy table that was there. So there was nothing to eat. That's why you bring the sandwich or some snacks when you play drums, because you burn it. So, okay. How tight are your tom skins and your bass drum? How tight? Uh, not. Uh, I mean, that's kind of medium tight. I, it doesn't matter how tight they are. It's tuning it to the size of the drum. If I went all the way up on the tight tightening of the skin, it's probably not going to sound that good because the, the drum is a 12. That's not that small. You know, same with this. This is a 13. 
This should have a lot of warmth to it, bottom end, you know. Hold your ears. But they're not loose. Like, if you listen to Carmine's drums, you see he doesn't have a tune anymore. His heads are really loose. <laughs> I'm kidding. They're kind of loose, you know. Where's that bloody key? That's another thing. Where's the key? The key. Where's the key? So, like this, if you went... Now you get now you're getting rattled. A bit much, right? Some guys will tune it like that. It's rattling. A lot of bottom end. It's not good for the drum. So you want to get get rid of the rattle and keep it in range of this circumference, let's call it, of the drum. See this one? I go all the way up. That sounds like kind of bongo-ish for that size drum. It'll work. See, that's that already dropped down a big jump from this in tuning a note. So this is too tight. That's more in the range of where it should be. Dun, 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 you know? So you got to mess around with this stuff. And then, uh, so the head's as tight as what you're trying to tune to. The bass drum, same thing. This is not that tight. This side's tighter than the front. You know, the lower you go, obviously, the more bottom end you get out of it until it starts rattling. This rattles a little bit. So, okay. One more question. What music do you listen to? What music do I listen to? You know, uh, I'll just go on the internet and browse around. And uh, I don't listen to too much. My ears are so fried from playing for all these years. So, And we're always working. So we're working on an album with Last in Line. We've got an EP that's going to come out, I think, at uh, the beginning of the next year. And we listen to a lot of stuff we're doing. And uh, so I don't sit there and go, I think. I'm going to listen to this, so I give my ears a rest, you know. But I'll browse around the Internet and and uh, listen to a couple of things here and there, but quickly. So, All right, one more question, because that was quick. What do you remember about the song, I Speed at Night? I Speed at Night. <laughs> um, I remember we wanted to have a fast song, and I don't know how we came up with that. It sounds like... The, the beginning, one, two, one, two, three, was probably me. Come on, let's start like this. Uh, guitar riff, accent, okay. again with that, and then bump, bump, and then there was a fill. I think it was a... That was the fill. Can't do it with the mic anymore. But uh, it was a burner, you know. Sometimes we'll go, okay, we got four or five songs recorded. We need an, like a burner, like stand up and shout, you know. We'll start messing around with that tempo and coming uh, coming up with stuff. That, I think that was partly written, uh, well, we rehearsed in Sound City in Los Angeles in the Valley, and then we went up to uh, Caribou Ranch in Colorado near Boulder, to record that album, uh, which was the the Last in Line album, titled Last in Line. So uh, half of it was written here, half of there, and uh, damn fast song. And when you play it live, sometimes the fast songs, you know, when you're playing, it's playing loud, it's hard to hear. So you got to keep it going. So anyway, I want to thank you guys. I'll see you next week. Yeah, I'm back on Monday, so I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining me. You guys want to learn something specific? You can send me an email. Drummonster2m1313 at gmail.
can't play with this mic.